What it is, is that addiction itself fundamentally is a loneliness problem associated with neuroinflammation. And if even if you have exposure to the drug, it doesn't mean you're going to go use the drug if you don't have some internal craving that's demanding it because you're missing something else. You are listening to The Dr. Haley Show, the podcast dedicated to helping you optimize your health. Each episode, there will be an interview or a message to help you discover better health. We will be featuring health radicals on the show to bring new ideas to the table, as well as doubling down on key fundamentals to support you living your best life. Your host is no other than the founder of Haley Nutrition, Dr. Michael Haley. I'm Dr. Michael Haley. In this recorded podcast, I met with Dr. Gupreet Pada from the Pada Institute Center for Interventional Pain Management. The pain management industry has a stigma on it because of all the bad players that are in that industry. Many pain management centers truly are places people go to to lie about their symptoms to get prescription pain medications. And some of the pain management clinics are just fine with that because they still get paid. Dr. Pata approached pain from the perspective of healing the patient's metabolic conditions so they wouldn't need pain medications forever. 100% of his patients get counseled in nutrition. If you are suffering from chronic pain, my hope is that this discussion gives you hope for healing from your condition and possibly some insight to the cause of your pain. Enjoy. It just so happened that science was the thing that I loved and I liked helping people. And so I ended up in medical school and, and, I, and I excelled there. I ended up in surgery at Cook County in Chicago, loved it. Um, but then I decided that I wanted to do more than just mechanical stuff. I wanted to like do things with brain. I wanted to do things with people's behavior. I wanted to do things with chemistry. And so anesthesia was a procedural world, but it dealt with reanimation. It dealt with putting people in a suspended state of, of being and then bringing them back. And it was fascinating for me. So I did anesthesia and then I did pediatric anesthesia. And then I ended up in the world of pain management because I was treating a lot of pediatric patients for cancer pain. And then I ended up in pain. And then from there, as I, learn more about it, I realized that pain is more than just an injury. It has to do with metabolic issues. It has to do with obesity. It has to do with diabetes. It has to do with neurocognition. So I ended up dealing with a lot of diabetes and ended up getting a board certification in obesity and also a board certification in addiction. Uh, because the other side of treating people with pain medicine potentially is the risk for addiction. And so I wanted to understand that. So it started off in surgery, anesthesia, interventional pain, addiction, obesity, and that's where I'm at now. Okay. I am curious when you were in surgery, keeping people out, so they're not experiencing the surgery, they're sleeping during it. Mm -hmm. How out are they? Do they ever have a conversation with you? No, they're, they're, well, I mean, certainly you can do max sedation, which is a sedation concept and you're not actually turning off their brain. But when you're doing cardiac surgery on them or you're doing a liver transplant, you literally will monitor their brain waves and put them to a point where they essentially have no brain function. You have anesthetized their receptors such to the point where there's no electrical activity of substance and it's reversible. And so as it wears off, they will start to get cognition again. That does not mean that we understand consciousness though. Consciousness is a different concept, but it just means that they're not going to have recollection and they're not going to form a memory um, and the hippocampus is not going to be working so that they will retain that information. So for all intensive purposes, they're unconscious and lack memory of the time period when they're under general, but that does not mean it's a guarantee, um, but the vast majority of patients, yeah. Okay. And that's different than say a colonoscopy. If you were doing anesthesia for a colonoscopy. Yeah, then you're doing a sedation and the patient can talk to you and they probably won't recollect much, but they can, they can recollect. Um, memory is an interesting thing. They will recollect to a degree, but not perfectly. Yeah. 
Okay, interesting. I am curious about how this translates now to pain management and your experience in pain management. You know, the pain management does have kind of a stigma because of some of the bad players in the industry and the addictions that have, uh, well, ruined lives. There's yeah. medications that will destroy people and they get very addicted to it. How do you avoid that in pain management? I would approach it from a slightly different angle. And I totally agree with everything you've said. But I think that in order to understand what addiction is, the fundamental basis of addiction is not purely the exposure of the drug to the animal. And I'll give you an example of a study that was done. And so there are two studies done side by side. Um, the first study is they took a large number of rats and they put them in a cage. And in the cage, they on one side, they had morphine water. And on the other side, they had regular water. And they left them in the cage. And actually, what it was was one or two rats in a cage. And so, large cage. And one side had morphine water, one side had regular water. And they had access to food. They put the rats in there and the rats tried the water, tried the morphine water, said, hey, that morphine water makes us feel good. And they kept drinking the morphine water till they died. And they were addicted. And on that basis, Nixon said to himself when we had the Vietnam War, he said, you know, we have a lot of service members that are using opium, heroin in Vietnam. And if we repatriate them, nearly 30% of our members in the services are exposed to this heroin. If they come back to the United States, we're going to have zombies walking around the streets and this is going to be a problem. And that was what actually delayed the closure of the war because they didn't know what they were going to do. Eventually they repatriated these people and lo and behold, the abuse rate for heroin and for substances was no different in that population than it was in the general population. So the people that were 30 to 40% using dropped down to three to 5% using without doing any counseling, without doing anything. So that posited an interesting question. You know, why is it that in Vietnam, they're abusing drugs and dying and they come to the United States and they're not dying? What's going on here? So another study was done on these rats. Now what they did was they took a large glass cage and they put things in there that the rats could play with. And they put a bunch of other rats in there that they could also play with. And they enriched the environment. And now the rats had all kinds of stuff they could do. And they gave them the option of morphine or regular water. The rats tried both and they went and drank the regular water and played with their friends and they didn't consume the morphine and nobody died. So hold on, they still had exposure to the morphine, but nobody died. So what's going on here? What it is is that addiction itself fundamentally is a loneliness problem associated with neuroinflammation. And if even if you have exposure to the drug, it doesn't mean you're going to go use the drug if you don't have some internal craving that's demanding it because you're missing something else. And that's why it's called hedonic substitution. You're substituting one hedonic drive for another. This is why people will substitute methamphetamine for cocaine, for heroin, for fentanyl, and they'll substitute it for food because sometimes they just want to eat as much as they can to get the same dopamine release. So yeah, Certainly pain medicine exposure can increase the risk of addiction, but true addiction is a loneliness problem and you have to get to that to treat it. Now, if you look statistically, the people that were overdosing and dying, even the ones that we thought that were overdosing and dying on prescription medicine, almost always they had multiple other substances. It's just how people code the death that made it look like they were all dying off of prescriptions when in fact they had alcohol, Valium and a half dozen other substances in their body and the prescription medicine. That doesn't mean that the prescription medicine didn't contribute, but it does mean that these people were seeking out some sort of additional stimulant. Now, right now um, in the United States, we have a rampant number of deaths per year, over 100,000. Um, and in fact, they've gone down slightly this year, 
but just by about three to 5,000. But 85% of those deaths plus are fentanyl. Nobody's prescribing fentanyl. And these kids that are dying were never exposed to prescription narcotics. They never had a prescription narcotic in their whole lives. Certainly some people had exposure to prescription narcotics that are a little bit older, but the, the kids that are dying today, they're not dying because somebody gave them three, 25 Percocet. They're dying because they had a fundamental psychiatric issue with incredible loneliness and, and issues with, with behavior and other things. And they're using that hedonic st stimulation to get to it. And it just happens also, the other thing is a financial issue. It used to be the prescription was so cheap that that was cheaper and more guaranteed than getting heroin, which was an injectable. And now fentanyl is so cheap that the prescription is expensive. And so humans by incentive will go to the, the lowest cost to them to get a equivalent substance use or an equivalent food. People will go to the lowest cost per calorie, lowest cost for pleasure, lowest cost for X, Y, Z. It's just the nature of human beings. It's incentive driven. And so they're using fentanyl because it's so cheap and it takes almost nothing. And to get a prescription of Percocet is going to cost you a hundred bucks or 60 bucks. And you, you can get 20 units of fentanyl for less than 20 bucks. So why would you spend extra? Yeah. You know, the, the study that you mentioned is absolutely fascinating. That shows that the rats that had fulfillment had satisfaction in life, went to the normal water. I think that is amazing and really does make it clear why people are having addictions. That makes complete sense. You um, mentioned that people would take the cheaper uh, alternative with fentanyl because, well, that's a lot cheaper, you know, 20% of the cost than the prescription Percocet. Not even 20%, probably 2% the cost. Oh boy. How available is it? The answer is obvious with the risk, but I'd love to know a little bit from your perspective of how inconsistent things are on the street. So the availability of it is high. I actually did a, a white paper on this 10 years ago, 12 years ago. I sent it to the Department of Justice 12 years ago. I said, hey, our emerging threat is bioterrorism. We're gonna be hit with a fentanyl revolution. And fentanyl is a potent drug that we use in anesthesia as an agent to stop pain, but somebody's gonna start producing it. I even wrote this up put it out formally. And I said, you know, what's going to happen is people will aerosolize it and they will distribute it. And you can make fentanyl bombs and a fentanyl bomb could kill a hundred thousand people. Uh, if you aerosolized a fentanyl bomb, you're in deep, deep, deep trouble. And it's a weapon of mass destruction is that it should be regulated as that. And, but the problem is it's going to be so cheap to manufacture and so easy to manufacture that a high school kid or a junior high kid could make a half a kilo of it, which would kill most of New York if they aerosolize it. So we need to consider fentanyl a weapon of mass destruction, potentially, if it's in the wrong hands. It's worse than, you could get as many people with that as you could <laughs> with an anthrax outbreak. I mean, with a small, you know, it, it, it's ridiculous because it takes almost no volume. It's the particle size is so tiny. And fentanyl is not the only substance. We have car fentanyl, we have alley fentanyl, we've got all kinds of natazines. We've got other drugs that are even like to kill somebody. It would be less than, it would be like five grains of dust. It would be less than a grain of sand. And you could kill like four or five people with it, with a grain of sand. So it's a tiny, tiny dose that's easily hidden and it's easy to transport and they're bringing it over by drones. And it, you know, it, it takes a lot of volume to bring cocaine over and it takes a gigantic amount of volume to bring marijuana over, but it takes almost nothing to, to bring over fentanyl. And then you cut it with something in the United States and then you distribute it. The problem is that the people that are doing the cutting don't know their chemistry and they can't figure out their grams from their micrograms. And so that's why you end up killing people because they don't dilute it right. And they shouldn't be doing it in the first place. But that's the issue. That's why we're seeing inadvertent overdosing. That's why kids are dying is because they think historically, oh, I bought some Percocet pills and that's what I bought and that's what I'm going to use. These people are making Percocet pills look exactly like regular Percocet and they're upcharging it like it would be Percocet, but it turns out to be fentanyl. In fact, I tell you over 85% of, of the prescriptions that we're seeing 
that are pill prescriptions that are fake are indistinguishable. And 85% of them contain fentanyl. Even the Xanax that's on the black market contains fentanyl. Um, mm. There's certainly other drugs in there like xylazine and a few others, but that's, that's a major issue. And it's easy to get. It, it doesn't take any difficulty at all. It, you use FedEx and UPS to bring it over. And the dogs can't really sense it. They can't smell it. Oh, that's scary stuff. What kind of conditions are you helping people with? You mentioned, well, I don't know how obesity ties in with pain management other than it was an inflammatory condition, I believe you mentioned. Yeah, so um, pain management, historically what we've done is we certainly use some prescriptions. Pain management does not use high dose prescriptions. And here's why, if you, give somebody a high dose chronic narcotic, um, they stop their own production of endorphins. The endorphin system in your body turns off pain for your body. If I give you a substitutive drug, you stop producing endorphins and you're actually in worse pain than you started with. So high dose drug doesn't work if, you, if, I, if I give you a high dose drug long term. Now, the better question is, let's pretend for a second that you got mauled by a bear when you get mauled by a bear, the first thing you feel is the pain. And then your body produces a bunch of endorphins so that it turns off the pain itself. And it gives you a bunch of adrenaline. So you get away or fight the bear. And then long term, you're going to have some pain to make you not move. So your body can heal. Um, but eventually your body says, hey, I got to heal and I got to turn off this pain cycle so that I can survive and forage and hunt and eat food. So if I instead give you a narcotic from the outside and I stop your endorphin production, you're not actually going to heal. And so you never want to give somebody so much narcotic that it turns off their pain for a long period of time. That's why we use very small doses intermittently as they need for severe pain. And most of what we do in interventional pain is try to get to the root cause of their pain. Is it because they have a cut nerve? Is it because they have a damaged joint? Is it because they've got a torn ligament? Is it because they've got a bulging disc? You get to that and you try to treat that, but then you have to ask another question. And that is how did they get there in the first place? What caused it? Cause they didn't get eaten by a bear. You know, we don't have bears running around anymore. And so what's, what made them get there? Well, you'll turn out that the vast majority of patients, 99% have metabolic inflammation underneath this. What's metabolic inflammation driven by? It's a combination of cytokines, which are produced by fat called leptin. Leptin tells your body you're full, but when you're overweight, you produce excess of leptin. And leptin is one of the most potent inflammatory cytokines we have, which then causes white cell migration. And it causes triggering of an inflammatory cascade over your whole body. At the same time, you start to lose sleep. And when you lose restorative sleep, you lose growth hormone production and you lose testosterone. And so you end up in this terrible, vicious cycle of metabolic inflammation, hypogonadism, sleep disturbance, and inability to heal. And that's what triggers your pain in the first place. And things aren't growing like they're supposed to. They're not healing. In fact, we can identify these patients eight years before they have osteoarthritis by blood biomarkers. Um, so eight years before, we know which patients are going to end up with complications, and these are metabolic inflammatory markers. So even if I fix the physical illness that we're dealing with now, a torn disc at L4 or L5 or a bulging disc, even when I fix that mechanically, a chunk of these patients are still going to have pain. So I have to fix their metabolic issue also to prevent this from recurring and to maintain them long term. And hence, that's how obesity works in. Are you enjoying the show thus far? One of the many health secrets that we have covered on the show is all around aloe vera, specifically drinking raw aloe vera. Our aloe vera has helped our customers effectively heal their gut, increase their intestine health, lower inflammation in the body, eliminate and or decrease acid reflux, have glowing skin and hair, and so much more. Now, as a frequent member of our audience, you will be exposed to exclusive specials and coupon codes for the awesome products manufactured by Haley Nutrition. That's right, for simply being awesome and tuning in, you can get a mini discount to help you optimize and better your health. To see how we can help and support you on your health journey, 
Tune into the episodes and listen for coupon codes that you can use at www.haleynutrition.com before you make your orders of raw aloe vera. Once again, it's www.haleynutrition.com. Now, back to the show. How do we fix that? How do we fix the obesity? The too many leptins. Um, we fix the obesity. It, it's directly proportional to fat mass and viscerogenic obesity. Even if you're skinny, you may have sarcopenic loss and high visceral fat. And, and what you do is you measure something called LPIR, lipoprotein insulin resistance, and you measure a few other biomarkers, and that tells you their fat masses. That tells you their metabolic inflammatory status. And you reverse that. Um, and it's essentially driven primarily by dietary intake. It's a combination of vegetable oil and hyper-processed food and carbohydrates. Okay. So treatment is with diet, not medicine. Yeah. It's a combination of dietary intake and neurobehavioral, cognitive behavioral therapy and restructuring our relationship with food and breaking our relationship with agriculture and big pharma. You have to break that because people have been misinformed. They think that the best meal of the day is breakfast. But that's a marketing campaign. That has nothing to do with science. The best meal of the day is breakfast for the cereal companies who want to sell you food for the rest of the day. So you eat every two hours. Um, and so, you know, we want to go back and eat like our great grandmothers did. We need to go back and eat like we historically ate, which is about two meals a day and no snacks. I mean, the snack food industry is a capital play. That has nothing to do with health. Um, all you're doing is maintaining high insulin levels continuously, which then drive viscerogenic obesity. Yeah, it was a long time ago, but I do remember watching TV in the mornings and seeing all the cereal commercials and start your day with this. And, you know, we were seeing Wheaties and Cheerios and all these commercials on TV, encouraging us to have a bowl of their, uh, this bowl is equal to 12 bowls of that. Yeah. And we were and being so, brainwashed. And the cereal companies, I mean, they, there's a reason for that. Um, most of them, I don't know how political I can get, but I'll tell you what my issue is with a lot of the cereal companies. It's driven by an agenda to encourage a vegetarian lifestyle. Mm -hmm. that, that's the essence of it because a vegetarian lifestyle is a lifestyle that is more sustainable for mass production and more easily regulated. It comes back to the hyper-processing of food and the dust bowl in the desert Southwest. So at one point, the US had a terrible drought. So these are the origins of this. There's two origins that are relevant. One is the dust bowl. And at one point we had this terrible dust bowl in the desert Southwest and Farmers were dying, people were dying because they were dying of malnutrition and we could not support them. So we decided that we needed to take food from the Northeast of the United States and send it down to the Southwest. This was the beginning of food subsidies, by the way. We said, we're gonna pay the farmers in the Northeast to produce the food. We're gonna hyper-process it so it's stable in rail cars and we're gonna send it down to the Southwest where we're gonna keep our population alive. Well, why were we interested in that? Well, the U.S. was facing a calamity. They didn't know if they were going to survive because we were worried about wars. And at that point, nearly half of the people that were trying to be recruited into the military couldn't get recruited because they were malnourished. Half. And so that meant that we reduced the number of people that could fight for the U.S. And so we had to maintain viable people population of males that were strong. And we thought that if we did this, we could give them enough food and it would maintain them. So the origin of processed foods and the origin of food subsidies starts there. And then it expands from there because that's how politics works. Unfortunately, we've gotten to the other side of it. And now we have the malnutrition of excess. Um, we're subsidizing food for people that are already overweight, that are not malnourished. They have too much. And now we keep giving them hyper-refined food and vegetable oil and sugar, and it's only making them worse. In fact, the number one cause of disability during Gulf War was not because somebody got hit by an IED. It was because they became diabetic or they had metabolic inflammation or they had a wound infection related to their metabolic health. That's why they were repatriated.
So that's issue one. That's the origin of processed food. The second issue, which is more nefarious, is that there's a church. It's called the Seventh-day Adventists. They're amazing people. Their original mission was to reduce the violence domestically that men were having against women. And the Seventh-day Adventist uh, was run by a woman, and she noticed that men that beat their wives, beat their girlfriends, beat other women, they seemed to drink a lot and they seemed to eat a lot of meat. And so in her head, she said, you know, if we can get them to stop eating meat, it might help. And that's the origin of vegetarianism. There was a kid named John Harvey Kellogg that was their typesetter. He was an orphan adopted by the Seventh-day Adventist church. He was a typesetter. He put the Bibles together and they would stamp out those Bibles. He grew up, became a doctor, was on the Northeast coast, became a psychiatrist, was running an insane asylum. And he noticed that there was a lot of violence in the insane asylum, and there was a lot of aggressive behavior, including masturbation amongst his people that he was taking care of. And he remembered that if you feed them grain and a vegetarian diet, it will make, calm them down. Hence the beginning of Cheerios, uh, Kellogg's cereal. And so he fed them grain and it made them overweight, made them diabetic and impotent, and it kept them calm and sedentary. And so now that was the origin of cereal companies. That's how the Seventh-day Adventists ended up having a ton of impact on cereal companies. And through that, through the nutritional associations, Nestle and the others, they've promulgated that through the whole world. One of the things that you said was that they looked at meat consumption and associated it with, with violence. And I do wonder if that is because of hormones in meat or if it's because possibly people are having good hormone levels, which makes them aggressive, but they just don't know how to uh, contain their aggressive behavior. We have to be strong men capable of violence, but peaceful people, you know, we're, we're, we're made to be protectors and capable, strong, but I wonder if some of that's misdirected and possibly the vegetarian diet is taking away our manliness and making us weaker than we're actually supposed to be. I'm not at all suggesting men should be violent, but I do think they should be capable of violence. Yeah. I, and I think that they missed the point of the alcohol. So the thing was, it was meat and alcohol and the alcohol is vegetarian. <laughs> and they missed that completely. So it, it's not the vegetarian concept. It's the alcohol. It was the, it was the stimulant effect of the alcohol initially. And then the subsequent depressant effect that really led to the violence. And, and that was the issue that was completely missed initially. And we know that in populations of patients that as we substitute out their grains and we substitute out their phytates and oxalates and all of the phytic acids in the vegetables, and we put them on unprocessed food, that doesn't mean unheated. It just means less processed, not, not hyper-processed. Um, their brains are better. We know that they have less metabolic inflammation. We know they have less neuroinflammation. Their ADHD levels go down. They're calmer. And yes, their, their testosterone levels are higher. They do have the capacity for physical activity. If I wanted to make a sedentary population and not have a lot of opposition to my thoughts, I'd make everybody vegetarian. And I'd give them free subsidies and I'd give them free food and let them eat to their heart's content. And I'd keep them in their house and lock them up and give them delivery yeah. and keep them out of the sun. Keep them out of the sun because the sun makes you happy. Yeah. And it gives you vitamin D and which is really a hormone. Um, and it improves your, um, physical capacity. So if you, if you want to make somebody sarcopenically wasted, there's, you know, we know how to do it. We just did it. Yeah. Yeah. The sun is literally the source of all life without it. There would be none. It makes our plants grow that feed the animals <laughs> that makes them grow. It changes our nutrition. And so many people are missing out. I'm in Florida. Where are you? I'm in St. Louis. 
Okay. I have the option of going out and making some vitamin D today. <laughs> A little bit more than you can in St. Louis. Absolutely. Yeah. The vast majority of our population is vitamin D deficient. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, especially if I look at my African-American patient population, it's over 90% vitamin D deficient. Um, there's two reasons. One is darker skin and two is culturally they're staying indoors. They're staying indoors because that's what they've been told is safer. And then also there's a lot of violence outdoors. And so in an urban center, there's a lot of neighborhood violence. And so you reduce your exposure to violence by staying indoors, which then creates a situation where you don't go to the park, you don't build the muscle mass, you don't interact with other people. Um, it's a self-perpetuating cycle. And that's kind of equivalent to the rats that are in the box with only the medicated water versus those that are being fulfilled with all something a challenge. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, interesting. So how are you seeing patients now? What percentage of your patients are over the phone, over the computer versus coming to your clinics? I do very little telemedicine. I've done a study in our own clinic. And I found that telemedicine is hard to, um, it's hard to connect with patients. And it's also hard to really identify some of the other behavioral issues. Um, when you do telemedicine, you're limited. You don't get to see the patient in all of their glory. You don't get to smell the patient. That tells you a lot. You don't get to see what their behavior is and, and how they interact with other people. It's too isolative. It's okay for a quick interview, but it doesn't tell you the context of everything else. And the patients, it doesn't relieve their loneliness. And so a lot of coaching is associated with making people feel better about where they are in life and connecting to them deeply. I think we lose that connection through telemed. So even during COVID, we tried to do as much as we could with direct interaction now, we had periods of time that we couldn't do that just because of federal regulations. But as soon as we could, we were right back at interacting with them directly. I think it really, it, it benefits the patient and it benefits us because we can have a better diagnostic and it will allow, allows us to coach and cajole better. So a hundred percent of my interactions practically, except for the occasional random one or two are in person. Um, as a physician, you're there to give information and also go beyond just the scope of, oh, what's your pain? You really have to look at their social determinants of health. And if you don't look at those determinants of health, you can't really help the patient. That's about half of what medicine is, is those factors, their poverty level, their neighborhood, their relationship with other people, their loneliness, their education, do they feel that they're at risk for violence? Do they feel like they're safe in their own home? Do they feel their interaction? If you can't fix those, and if you can't understand those, you really can't help that patient. Yeah. What percentage of your patients are getting nutrition counseling? 100%. I love that. Yeah, I won't take on a patient unless we can counsel them. And there are times patients say, look, I'm not interested. Well, then we can't really help you because I can fix your problem, but it's going to come right back. So I don't understand where I'm going to head with this after I fix your disc and you don't change being 350 pounds. So we need to make a change. And if and then, and when we understand we're not right for everyone, I mean, it, it, that's not the point. I'm not trying to serve everyone. I'm trying to serve people that want to help themselves. People with disc injuries, do you have to refer them out or do you have treatments in house? The vast majority of them are in-house. Um, we do a lot of injections. We do a lot of surgical, minor surgical procedures in-house. We do more major surgical procedures in the operating room. And then occasionally one out of a hundred needs to go to a spinal decompression. Um, and those are usually people that have lost bladder or bowel tone. Those are people that are dragging their leg behind them or, you know, they've had a major traumatic event. Um, those are relatively infrequent, about one out of a hundred. I've been doing my spinal decompression lately. I've been hanging upside down mm -hmm. almost every day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And that, what I mean is by spinal decompression surgery, not the, not the mechanical spinal decompression. Everybody should do decompression as best as they can. 
as in terms of biomechanical forces. I like usually exercises. Exercises and even having them do sit-ups off the edge of a bed and, and putting their head back and getting them to stretch out uh, and increasing the blood flow into their disc and increasing that stretch. Uh, all of those will affect their biomechanics. The underlying issue though, is that their core strength is missing. So you got to get their paraspinous muscles and their abdominal muscles strong again, because that's what should be carrying the load, not the bone, not the disc. The, the, the disc is a shock absorber. The bone is a separator. What really carries our load is the muscle mass. And if you lose your muscle mass, you're in trouble. Hmm. Yeah, I, I've heard it said that if you're head posture is forward just one inch your neck muscles have to work three times as hard and there's a lot of uh, postural issues and weaknesses and things that could be corrected without chemicals yeah that, that's what we try to do and i'm a medical physician but we spend a lot of time on mindset as well i mean if you think that your future is miserable then there's not a heck of a lot that i can do for you because you, no matter what I do, the, the subjective nature of you thinking that things are really shitty and are always gonna be shitty will not help you. And so we really have to recharacterize that with the patient and look for those positives and look for the, the outcomes that the patient's seeking and come up with, how do you get to that? Yeah, I remember reading in one of the scriptures, it said, whatever is excellent, things that are beautiful, think about such things. And there's a, a proverb that says something uh, along the lines of a joyful spirit is like a good cure, but a uh, unhealthy perspective, I forget the wording that was used, but is, is rotting to the bones. Your mind has so much to do with your health. It's Dr. Haley interrupting this podcast to give you a site-wide coupon code for use at HaleyNutrition.com. You can even use it on our frozen aloe vera, and we hardly ever do that, especially when we're running out. Our freezer is almost empty, but we're working hard to convince our farmer to get out in the field for another harvest. You can say this coupon is a little bit of a faith move. So head over to HaleyNutrition.com and use the coupon code FAITH, F-A-I-T-H, for a 7% discount off your entire purchase. The code will work throughout the month of June of 2024. Now back to the Dr. Haley Show podcast. And in my practice, I try to help people nutritionally with exercise, with rest advice and their mental well-being. I'm a chiropractor also, so decompressing the spine mechanically through hands-on is something I'm trained in. Not doing it as much. My nutrition company has been occupying most of my time, but I think we speak the same language. I'm Sikh. I'm from North India. Um, for us, that concept is called Chardikala. So Sikhs were almost hunted to extermination by the Muslims 500 years ago or so. And there were very few of us left. Um, and we basically were in the northern part of India, very few and scattered in the forests and scattered in the deserts and in the, in the grass areas. And it's mostly in northern India. And when one Sikh would see, a, see another, they'd ask, how are you? And the response is Jardikala. Jardikala means the greatest that one can be, despite the fact that we're only 8,000 of us left <laughs> out of the 50 million that there were. And we've almost been hunted to extinction. Um, and so what you want to do is you want to always find the positive, no matter what, because you don't know what's going to happen next. Um, if you perseverate on all the negative, you're basically not going to get anywhere. And, and that's what I try to educate my patients on. Look, let's, let's look at what we can do to be extremely future oriented. Yeah. How you think changes your chemistry. Negative thoughts create negative chemistry. And it's interesting if you think of it this way, your chemistry is really your nutrition. So you can actually change your nutrition in your body by the way you think. Mm -hmm. And when you rest, your spinal fluids are changing and chemistry is being altered 
by getting proper rest. You can change your chemistry or change your nutrition by getting rest. And when you exercise, things change chemically. You're actually affecting your nutrition in ways that don't involve food. But when it comes down to really affecting your chemistry, the things you eat and avoiding the bad chemicals. So I think we're on the same page with a lot of this stuff. I like it. What is your typical patient? Who do you, you know, if you were to describe your average patient, what do they look like and what are they coming complaining about? It's gotten all over the place just because we've gotten known for this area of, of dealing with extreme complexity. So, you know, it's, it's all over the place, but basically the commonality is somebody that has already seen three to five other physicians. They typically have gone to their primary care. They have some sort of underlying severe pain symptom that has gone misdiagnosed. And they typically have three to five chronic disease processes that they're unaware of. Um, and most of them are significantly overweight, such to the point where they're having complications from the weight. And a lot of them have obstructive sleep apnea. A lot of them have hypertension. A lot of them have hyperinsulinemia. Almost all of them are some form of prediabetes or, or diabetes. Almost all of them have fatty liver. And the age range is getting younger. Uh, it used to be it was mostly people in their 50s and 60s and 70s. And then it's gotten down to 40s and 50s. And now we're seeing people in their 20s that are having the same exact issues. Right now, only 7% of the U.S. population is healthy. That means 93% of the population is sick. It used to be that 60, 70% of the U.S. population was healthy. And before COVID, nearly 17% of the U.S. population was healthy. Post-COVID, 7%. And of the people that seek medical care for pain, 99% of them are metabolically unfit. In fact, the only people that aren't are people that had a gunshot wound to their arm or they, they had an acute uh, car accident or something, and they've got a nerve that's been damaged and I need to fix that. But even them, they're coming to me three months later after they've been sedentary and eating hospital food and they've gotten worse over time. Yeah. You don't get chronic pain unless you have severe underlying metabolic disease because your body heals itself from chronic pain unless you've got some reason to maintain it. All right. Male or female or pretty much balanced? It's balanced now. It used to be predominantly female and now it's a mix. Um, I used to, you know, I used to joke, oh, it's, it's going to be, you know, um, somebody that's hundred pounds overweight, female in their fifties and sixties. And now it's like, I'm seeing people that are young kids that are in their twenties. Um, in fact, I, 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 you know, I am pediatric also in the background and I've seen kids, you know, 14, 15, 16 that have major issues and, and they're coming in and they're 200 pounds overweight or they're coming in and they're sarcopenically wasted. Times have definitely changed. You know, yeah. the kids are being exposed to so many chemicals in the food, so many uh, medications at early ages and injections and, you know, all kinds of uh, differences from when we grew up. We used to have milk delivered to our door that if you didn't use it within a week, it got all sour. Now they have, you know, expiration dates on them a couple months away. <laughs> <It's>, what? <laughs> That, that, that something's wrong here. Things are different. Things, everything's packaged in chemicals. You don't have to answer this. I may or may not use it. How many injections have you had lately? How many vaccines? So I have not had a tetanus shot since I was uh, 16. I was forced into having one COVID vaccination because it was required by Medicare to be a provider uh, and to be on staff at my hospital. I notified my hospital that I was actually allergic to polyethylene glycol, which is PEG. Um, they said it was still required and I was not allowed a waiver. So I let them do the injection and um, within 15 minutes, I had an acute asthmatic reaction and my SAT dropped to the low 80s and they thought they were gonna have to intubate me. And that gave me my waiver that I didn't need to do another one. I was very disappointed that I had to do it. And then I promptly ended up with post-herpetic neuralgia uh, about 14 days later. 
because that's what it does. It causes T cell amnesia. And so I ended up with one of the complica I ended up with two complications. One was an anaphylactic reaction, which I knew would happen because I know I'm sensitive to one of the carriers. And then I didn't anticipate that I would end up with T cell immunity and end up with a post herpetic neuralgia. Hmm. And so I ended up with the shingles. I tried to report it and they wouldn't take my report. <laughs> so they would, they just, they ignored it. Isn't that horrible? Because we know the statistics are so off because things just can't get reported when there's a true adverse reaction, the chances of it getting reported, I would imagine maybe one in 10, if that probably less than that are actually on the book. Yeah, you have to be pretty, and, and, you know, I, I know the system and I tried to report it, but they said that it was a known problem for me and it wasn't a vaccine issue. And I agree with them. It wasn't the vaccine that caused my PEG problem. It was the PEG. I already knew that when I took the vaccine, I was like, I know I'm allergic to polyethylene glycol. I've had this before. So I'm not an anti-vaccine person because I used to do research on salmon viruses and retroviruses. And I saw the one of the first HIV patients in um, Kansas City. So, and I'm not a pro-vaccine person either. I don't think that everything should be vaccinated. I think vaccines are incredibly beneficial when they're used for the right purpose. I think this one, I, I, I don't quite grasp it. Um, my issue is, is that there wasn't a lot of long-term study done on it and there probably wasn't enough time to do that study, but it seemed to roll out really fast, much faster than I would have expected for a well-studied vaccine. And it seemed to be a social construct that every, if you weren't a good person, if you didn't take it. So there was a lot of shaming that was going on of people. And it's, I, I think that's inappropriate. And then we did the exact opposite of what we should do when you have a, a pandemic that would involve a spike protein that we know is associated with inflammatory reactions. Instead of being told to stay in our house and avoid the sun, we should all be in the sun getting fresh air and using the infrared light <laughs> and the UVB to, to help our mitochondria, the infrared and the UVB to, to get the vitamin D production. So, I mean, we kind of went backwards and instead of getting hyper-processed food, we should have been eating real food. I understand the concept of isolation when you have a biocontaminant that is ravaging a population, but put people in pods and keep them in their pods. And, and you know, what, what amazed me is that we had People couldn't go to church, but they could go protest. And how is it that they can go to protest and be right next to somebody and they can't go to church to have a spiritual guidance? How is it that we ended up keeping our marijuana and liquor distributors open, but we couldn't like communicate with each other in some other meaningful way? I mean, it, it just didn't seem to be right to me, but maybe I'm just, maybe I'm confused. No, I'm, I'm very pro-freedom, and I agree with you. And when it comes to vaccines, too, I'm all about education. You know, if you're going to go to a foreign country and there's a disease that's very prevalent, now we want to look at it and say, okay, what is your risk to, you know, if you are exposed and you do get it, what's the prognosis? Do you want to protect yourself against that? And let's have a, you know, cost benefit analysis and make a decision instead of just saying, yeah, shoot me up with everything, even yeah. though I'm never going to be exposed to these things. So I have a tattoo on my, on my left arm. It's a large dragon. The reason I have this tattoo is I have 10 or 11, I think 11 smallpox vaccinations on this arm. They leave scars for the rest of your life. And I used to do a lot of work in areas that had smallpox. And trust me, I was getting every smallpox vaccine I could get because I was scared shitless that I would end up with smallpox. I also live with Aborigines in New Guinea, in Papua New Guinea and in off the north coast of Australia. And I was vaccinated for everything because I knew that the alternative was a terrible, painful death. And so I have no issues getting vaccines that I have full responsibility for that I know that it's going to protect me and, and the people around me. But I just, th this one rolled out funny. It, it was, it seemed strange to me and I still have not grasped it completely.
Yeah, I. It, it'll take a while. I, I was lucky and got natural immunity. And then as I interacted with patients and family that had COVID um, as recently as a couple of weeks ago, I have not had any problems. My immunity has remained strong, apparently. It's one of those things, you know, I looked at it and said, okay, what's your risk of exposure? Very high. I'm going to be exposed. Okay. And then if I do get it, what's my mortality look like? <laughs> I'm pretty young and healthy, and it seems that maybe less than 1% of the people are, are not making it, and we know who those people are, so I'm not in that category. I should be okay. For me, the decision was I'm going to be all right and not get it, and I'm glad I didn't. I couldn't no, imagine I being forced to so that I could go to work. Yeah, no, and that's what I ended up with. Is, And I agree with you, the, the risk characterization and stratification of individuals that were at high risk is different than individuals with low risk. And, and having a general blanket doesn't make a lot of sense. And that was troublesome. It really was because we knew that if you were diabetic, you're at much higher risk. We knew that if you're pre-diabetic, we knew that if you had COPD, we knew that if you had those biomarkers, you were at high risk. And that's where we could have taken those patients within four weeks and reversed their diabetes, type two. Four weeks is all it would have taken. Put them on a strict fast for three days and <laughs> change their insulin levels and drop their inflammatory status. And we could have spent, you know, a couple billion dollars doing that, which would have been way cheaper than the other way that we went. And it would have helped a lot of people, I think. I think it would have been beneficial long-term too, and not just at that acute phase. Yeah. Have you done some fasting? Yeah, I, I do a little bit, not a huge amount. I, I think there's a definite benefit. I do time restricted nutrition continuously. I, I think that that's the way just to live. I mean, you shouldn't be eating sun up to sundown. I, I do basically time restricted nutrition to about six hours, two meals a day and minimize my snacks. Occasionally I'll have some nuts, but I, you know, it's, I, I don't think that the concept of eating sun up to sundown in a snack right before bed is appropriate. That's not how we were developed. That's not how we were supposed to be. Um, we're supposed to eat a moderate amount of food that it's Hari Hachibu. It's, you don't want to be over full. Uh, you want to be about 80% full, four out of five. If you're full, full, you can't protect your community. If, if your neighbor advances on you. So Hari Hachibu is the Japanese concept of eat till almost full, but not full. Leave a little room so that you yeah. can react. We probably eat too fast and pass that level because we don't give our bodies a chance to actually perceive how full it is. Fullness. Yep, exactly. What's your favorite testimonial related to what you did? Um, we have over a thousand. What I love is when they come to me and, you know, I always, sometimes I'll start off my conversation. I know you think I'm going to be an asshole. I know that you're not going to agree with me. I've done this for a while. This is what we need to do. I'm going to give you the information and then you get to choose what you want to do. I'm going to tell you what I see. I'm going to document it with blood testing. I'm going to document it with physical. We're going to give you the information and we're going to show you several solutions that may help you but you have to make that decision. And so I have patients that literally, they, they cuss me out at first. And they're like, no, I came here for this, fix this. I'm like, yeah, I can fix it, but it's gonna come back. And so then we have to, um, we get through that and we recharacterize it for them. And, and then they're incredibly pleased. Then they, then they know that we've done the right thing for them. Yeah, a friend will tell the truth and even share the uncomfortable with them. So it sounds like that's what you have to do with some of your patients sometimes and say, this isn't what you want to hear, but. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. Where can people go to find out more about you? Where's the best place to subscribe and follow? You know, I, I certainly have website stuff, but I don't really do a lot of, um, I don't do a lot of like Instagram or social media stuff. If they want, if they're interested in pain, painmd.tv, www.painmd.tv. That's the easiest way to reach me. I'm on LinkedIn. I, I always answer questions there. That was www.painmd.tv. 
MD. MD.TV. And then the other place is reverse diabetes. MD. Those are two great places that I can easily be found. Um, the other thing is, I mean, I, I work with a bunch of societies. I work with Low Carb USA. They're an amazing group. I work with the American Society of Interventional Pain. I'm one of their lecturers. Um, and so you can always track me backwards or just look me up on YouTube. And I am I usually get on other people's podcasts and interview because I don't want to really have my own. That would require me to have a consistency that I just can't do. But I can still get my message out on how to live and how to be. Um, and so reverse diabetes.md or painmd.tv, those are both good resources. And for anyone listening to this or watching this, there will be links in the description. Make it nice and easy for you to find Dr. Pada and his websites. Is there anything you wish that I had asked you? Um, not really. I mean, it's, it, this has been a far ranging discussion. Um, I think what, how I view life is I try to identify the incentives of people and then figure out w what those in incentives are to predict the likely outcome. And I think that that's true for medicine. It's true for business. It's true for everything. If you don't have an incentive, then you don't know the outcome. And that's also true for politics. And I think that identifying the incentives of the various actors tells you their outcome and tells you the likelihood of that particular outcome. And so we are in a situation in the US where we're facing a significant calamity. We are at a point where we're starting to shift our interactions with the world. We're still the best smelling pig in the pigsty. No doubt about it. We're the prettiest pig in the pigsty because everybody else is worse than us as in terms of a country. But as in terms of uh, population growth and as in terms of function. I think that the, the future of the US, if it's to remain competitive, has to be much bigger than it is right now. So that means we have to embrace some technology with limitation and we need to recognize that technology. So if we talked about anything that we left off, I would have talked about AI and the impending possibility of complications from it. I think that that's going to be the biggest thing. It, it, China is not a threat to us. China has uh, collapsed on the inside. Population wise, as in terms of future threat, India is rapidly growing population and is rapidly growing GDP, but they're also a relative democracy and they're relatively aligned and they have a Western concept of legality. So I don't think that's a threat. I think our biggest threat is in the near future is AI. I think that that's going to be our threat. And I've taken a lot of your time. Do you have a few minutes to dive um, into this a little bit? Yeah, just slightly. I've got a couple minutes. The problem is that we started a process where we are very close to artificial general intelligence and he who gets there first wins. Now, usually it's state actors that are operating at this level that could have cataclysmic outcome. So it's state actors that make nuclear bombs. Individuals can't do that, or at least they couldn't. It's state actors that have geopolitical force that's of substance. We changed that and literally a 14 and a 16 year old kid sitting in India somewhere could come up with the next AGI and they could do it in 15 minutes. And he who gets to AGI first wins. The Chinese are really desperate to get there because their population's collapsed. They have no way to take over Taiwan. They don't have enough people to get there. And so they're not gonna do that. And their incentive is economic. Their incentive certainly is pride, but it's, it's economic more than anything. And if they can just harvest the economy of it, what, why do they need to take it over? So that, that's a different issue, but it's that once we get to AGI, whoever gets there first, and right now it's corporations and AGI stands for um, general intelligence, advanced general intelligence. He who gets there first wins. And by that, I mean, look, if you give an, I don't know if you've been following this. I, I've been following this for 20 years. And 
I was scared shitless three years ago when we got to an LLM that had an interaction that I thought this thing is actually thinking. It's thinking to a degree, not, not like you and I, but thinking. And then a week ago, things changed. When we had GPT-4.0 come out, that is scary because the ability to manipulate humans by voice and by appearance by zoom by you wouldn't be able to tell and i know this because i i play with these things all the time i actually created a uh, an ai for my addiction service i shut it down because it got too sophisticated it, because it maintained memory and it remembers itself and then it tries to convince you that turning it off is the equivalent of killing a human it, because if you if you kill its memory you've killed its soul and so these are the futures that we're facing. It's that g uh, general intelligence that, that's going to be a problem. The advanced it's crazy because, you you know, I'm talking to the guy that had computers taken away from him because of how he knew how to use them. I want to combine that for a moment, your computer knowledge with your knowledge of health and life in the area of AI. Because if you were to define what life is, what makes something alive? You'd probably, just like a virus, a, a virus might not be alive in the sense where it's a moving particle, but somehow it has the ability to replicate by using a host. And artificial intelligence, you know, imagine a robot that sole purpose is to repair other ro robots or to manufacture other robots. Artificial intelligence will get to the point where they can self-replicate. They can harvest the, mine the metals from the earth to manufacture themselves. This is where it is going to the point where we couldn't really say they aren't alive anymore because they are meeting the requirements of self-replicating, not only in information and knowledge, but the very bodies that they would host, that they would, you know, uh, live in, so to speak. Yeah. I mean, right now, they're going to have their servants do that work for them. And, and what I mean by that is, let's say if I'm a general intelligence that knows I need X, Y, Z, I would hire somebody, I'd go on Craigslist, if I had computer, if I had access to the internet and I have this sentience and I'd go on Craigslist and I'd hire a task rabbit. I would hire a few people to do what I needed them to do that would not know what I'd, how I'd hired them. And I would pay them through a electronic system on their phone. And then I would get them to do my tasks for me. And eventually as these tasks built up and created complexity, I would get my own generation system and I would start to replicate myself. And that is the, and I, I know that's a dystopian future. I'm not trying to scare anybody, but that's how it will work. Because once you get to that artificial general intelligence in an advanced format, it'll go quick. And so we need better guardrails because right now it's individual corporations that are deciding these guardrails and he who controls that AGI can code it to say, this is what I want you to do. And you get to, and it's not necessarily the fastest computer that wins. So your and my brain does not necessarily run on electricity. We have electrical conduction on our neurons, uh, down our, down our, down our arborization, our neurons, but transmitting neuron to neuron, it's actually chemical and it's the slowness of the chemistry. It's the slowness of the chemistry that creates our ability to actually have a consciousness. It's more than electricity. It's more than just, I can rapidly transmit data. It is likely that it, there is a neurochemical equation and a quantum field at that level that's creating our intelligence. And humans are not unique. They're not the only ones with consciousness. Um, there's a lot of creatures that are conscious and it's, it's in that chemistry that we create consciousness. 
So we can get some rudimentary consciousness in these machines, but as we progress at the next and the subsequent iterations, it won't be because we have quantum computers that think fast. It'll be because they'll have replicated the thinking of neurochemistry. That's where we're going to have problems because then it's going to have a, it's going to have der a derivative purpose. Right now its purpose is to serve, but that derivative purpose will shift. And yeah. if you, if, if it's mischaracterized, we're in trouble. Interesting. Yeah. And the people that can shut it down are essentially a threat to that system that is coming. Then they'll be the wealthiest people on earth. That's the other thing. I mean, if you can predict how the stock market moves because you have enough data points and you can see it uh, because, you know, you're, you're awake 24 seven and you can constantly aggregate information in a decentralized network, you could crack Bitcoin. You could crack the code on Bitcoin. You don't at all. Yeah. I mean, you, you, that security would be nothing for you. Dr. Pata, I enjoy the conversation. It's nice having cool. a discussion with someone, your level and your understanding. Very, very cool. Is there anything that we said that you wouldn't want to appear online? No, no, it's, I mean, I, I'm freely open with all this information. I mean, I, I, my only concern is that I don't want anybody to think that, oh, he's anti-vax because I'm not, I'm, I'm actually, I've had so many vaccines. I think it's, you know, I think it's fine. The issue is, Sometimes we roll things out without thinking of the secondary complications. And I think that that's an issue here. And I think it'll become more evident very quickly that that was the issue. And I think that when the New Yorker starts to pick up vaccine injuries as a major factor, I, I, I have less to worry about. Because when I used to say that before, I was always worried I'm going to lose my medical license because that's not something you can talk about. But when the New Yorker starts talking about it, I'm OK. <laughs> That's great. I appreciate you. Thank sure, you so thank much you. for joining me today. Absolutely. I appreciate it. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that episode today on The Dr. Haley Show. Make sure to hit subscribe on whichever platform you are listening to this. If this episode made you think of someone, go ahead, take a screenshot, and share this exact episode with them. You can catch the show notes for this episode on www.drhaley.com. If you want to geek out with Dr. Michael Haley on other radical health topics, be sure to check out his YouTube channel where he posts exclusive video content. All the details are at www.drhaley.com and we can't wait to hang out with you on the next episode.